after the service and give you a gift from the church. Um, the way we do this around here is we ask, ask you, as our guest, to remain seated. That's the best place to stand, is it not? I have uh, some interesting news to say. Hey, 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 just go away. I'm talking. <laughs> Thank you. He was getting ready to announce my birthday. But uh, that was yesterday, and that's old news. You know, I, I hate birthday parties. I don't mind birthdays, but I'm not a big party fan. So my wife decides for my 60th birthday that she wants me to have a party. I said, honey, we've gone without parties for almost everyone, but you've done it once before, so I guess one more. Not that I don't like people. I love people. I just, if you have a birthday party and you have it at your house, guess who does all the yard work? <laughs> and who pulls out the furniture and moves everything around? Now, you know, I, I just kind of feel it in my bones that these parties are way too much. I guess it's better than the parties I used to have before I met Christ. And I felt it in my head, but uh, I said, how's 60? I said, it's a lot like 30, but your body hurts. <laughs> but thank you, Alan. Praise the Lord. And it's interesting because we talk about uh, part six in our message is, is the, it has to do with the worship of the church. And I'll tie in a little bit about that, that whole party mindset in a minute, so at least the celebration part of it. We've been going through this series. I hope that it's been impacting your heart and your life. I really believe that this series of messages was right where we needed to be as a church because it's, for those of us who know this information, it's, it's certainly good to rehearse it. But for those who have never really been exposed to these messages about what the church is really all about, it should certainly be an eye-opening time in the Lord. I really do believe that most people don't have a real glimmer of an idea about what the church is really all about. We kind of think it's that place we go when we feel like it or when it's, a, you know, we may be even religiously involved and we see our friends and family, yada, 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 but we just miss the whole aspect of what the body of Christ on the earth is really all about today. As we've gone through the messages, this is really, a, I think we, this, was, this is part six, but it's really part two. You say, what do you mean? Well, part one had to do with five messages that dealt with the nature of the church. And in those messages on the nature of the church, we dealt with, number one, the importance of the church, Number two, the purpose of the church. Number three, the mission of the church. The fourth message, we dealt with on the distinctives of the church. And last Sunday, we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the power of the church. Today, we move to a se different segment of the whole study. It's not so much on the nature of the church as we deal with the ministry of the church. Y'all make your mind up what you're going to do, all right? You're driving me crazy. It's hard enough to concentrate when you're 60, okay? <laughs> But the nature, the, the worship of the church is, is, is what we're going to deal with primarily today. Uh, yesterday, we had this party for family and got together with some relatives I didn't even know. You ever have some of those show up? Who is that person? Then I realized I'm just 60. And... Now, I preached on the Holy Spirit last week. So somebody fix our, our, our dilemma there. But just don't point at it. Turn it off if it's bothering you. <laughs> I'll preach on this side over here so you'll have light on this side. But at the party, you know, we had, a, we had a good time, but, you know, we got cards. Some of them were crude. Some of them were funny. Some of them were very nice. You know, they said all those nice things about you like to believe about yourself. And it was kind of a, a, a celebrating moment of, 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 you know, an honor of someone and recognizing someone. But we do that at parties. You know, we get together and even anniversary parties, we tell a couple how, what a blessing they are and what they mean to our life. And we have this little moment of, of celebration. In fact, we get the whole idea of the word celebrity from this idea of celebration. We're living in a kind of celebrity, celebrity oriented world. I mean, there'll be, in fact, I don't know how I many million, perhaps at least hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who will gather in stadiums today and they'll do about three hours of celebrity worship. You know, they have a team out there and they're, they're celebrating and they're hooping it up and they're having a big old time and they're cheering on their teams and all those things and there's stars on the team, you know, celebrities, the, the quarterback, or the running back, or the defense. Everybody's celebrating those different individuals. Uh, there'll be times that we go through our life perhaps that you know, people will celebrate you. You graduated perhaps. You, you got out of college or you, you got a job or you got married or what. And you have these, these moments of celebration. 
Well, really, I think that we need to understand the greatest celebration that really ought to take place is right here every Sunday morning as we celebrate the king of the universe who fills the world, amen, with his power and glory. There ought to be a time where we really learn how to celebrate. And I believe that's the heart of what real worship is, that the, we gather, you know, and we... We honor the Lord and we celebrate the Lord together. There's been a lot has, has been said, even from the pulpit here, about the importance of uh, private worship, that we need to learn how to honor the Lord and worship the Lord, whether it's in our prayer closet or driving down the freeway in our car. We need to learn what private worship is all about. That is not the heart of the message today. The heart of the message today will deal with a corporative worship. And I believe that is a collective celebration. We as the people of God, we get together and we celebrate the God of the universe. We celebrate Him for who He is. We celebrate Him for what He's done and what we're trusting Him to do. It should be a time of glorious celebration so that when we sing those songs, like we just sang, it is from our hearts, it's, it's from everything that we are, we are going to worship the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. And I think sometimes we just don't really get the whole picture of that. We come to church and we might kind of get involved in the singing part of the service, but we really don't realize that the, what the focus ought to be during these times. The focus on worship, the focus on celebration, the focus on honoring the Lord. There's a passage in Psalms 33 which says this, Praise is becoming fitting for the upright. Now the word fitting has to do with uh, something that looks good, something that, that is right. In fact, you could put it this way, praise looks good on you. That's the way the, real, the, 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 the Hebrew terminology would read there. It really looks good. You look good in praise. You look good in worship. You, the more you adore, uh, honor the Lord, the more you're adorn, adorned. And you, you see people might tell you at times, you know, oh, that's your color, you look good in that. Or, you know, that, that, that suit really befits you. Or that dress, that really just, you know, that just that makes you look good. Well, you want to know what makes you look good? Praise is becoming for the upright. Praise makes us look good. Praise makes us look good to God. God likes it when we worship Him. And I'm really talking about, not again in this individual sense where we kind of have our quiet time with the Lord or we have a prayer closet or time of Bible study, but we gather together and our focus is collectively as a group of people on the Lord Jesus Christ, upon God our Father, and we are praising Him. I want to talk to you about several things that worship does in the context of us getting together as a church and joining together with one heart with one mouth and celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ together. Obviously, I think we understand this, that worship is what lifts us up to our glorious Lord. Now, there's a lot of individual components. I mean, we could do a lot of different studies on worship. We have in the past. But the bottom line, the foundation for all worship is that verse in Ephesians 1, 3, which says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's not saying God is blessed. He's saying we're giving God our blessings. We're honoring Him. Now, the word for blessing, and we have talked about this at different times in different places, that when it talks about offering God our praise and blessing God, it comes from the word, the Greek word, eulogia. And eulogia, it literally means to speak well of someone. In fact, it's eulogia that false prophets use to convince people of the error that they believe and the lies. They, they speak well of people. They pat them on the back. They tell them how wonderful they are. They, they, and that's what Paul said, with their good words, their eulogia, they will deceive people and they'll convince people. But it's not a bad thing, eulogia. It literally means just say nice things about. And when I'm going to bless the Lord, what's that mean? I'm going to say good things about God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to extol and exalt and glorify the Lord. I'm going to bless His holy name. That's what we're called to do. We're called to offer God thanks and blessings. The Scripture tells us in Psalms that it's good that we give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High. What's good? It's good that we give thanks to the Lord. It's good that we praise the Lord. Let me tell you what's not good. It's kind of understood here. It's not good for you not to give thanks to the Lord. It's not good for you not to sing praises to the Lord. Well, Brother Joe, you know, I can't carry a note in a bucket. We're not asking you to get in a bucket. We're not asking you to carry a note. We're asking you just to sing praises. You can do it in the shower. You ought to be able to do it in the church. Amen. Sing praises to God. 
It doesn't matter. This is not a talent show. We're not here to see who has the best voice. And I know, you know, I used to sit behind that lady in church too, you know, when I was a kid. She sing louder than everybody else in the church, and she wanted everybody to hear her beautiful parts, you know. I say, get in the choir, man. <laughs> get up there if that's what it is. But you know, then there's always that person who couldn't sing, and, you know, I have a few of those on my staff. We won't mention any names. But their initials are Tim Strickland. <laughs> Brother Tim's gone, so I can pick on him today, amen. But I'd rather hear him just shout and hoot and holler than somebody with a perfect voice whose heart's not right, amen. We're called on to make a joyful what? Noise. I didn't hear that. A joyful what? Noise. noise. Every one of us can put a little music behind it and make some noise for Jesus, amen. We can honor the Lord. We have been called... Give, and given, I believe, this special privilege to honor the Lord. You see the elements of what real worship is in Psalms 100 when it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. What are they doing? They're speaking good about God. They're speaking honorable things about the Lord. And they're not just saying them out as a testimony. They're saying them to God. They are giving honor to God. It's nice. Yesterday I opened cards and there were honorable things said to me. That's nice, but I am nowhere near deserving uh, in, in any kind of comparative sense to God who's worthy of all our praise and all our glory. And we are called as his people to collectively bless his name, to collectively exalt him, to collectively worship him together. We're to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We're to enter his courts with praise. Now, thanksgiving in, in the Bible is usually associated uh, for worshiping God for what he's done. And we ought to be able to thank God for what he's done. While we talk about blessing the Lord or praising the Lord, we're talking about th praising him for who he is. That's the real heart of it. I mean, we thank God for what he's done. By the way, if he wasn't who he was, he wouldn't be able to do what he's done. So we need to understand that that real personal, practical part of our worship is thanking God for who he is that he is God. There's none like him, none before him, none after him. He's God and holy God, and he's to be deserve, he deserves all the worship and adoration and the praise. So this is not, again, just something I want to do privately. This is collective worship, where we come together and we begin to magnify God's glory. We begin to honor the glory of God. In fact, all this worship is focused on the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that God is jealous for his glory. So our job as we come in, our part and responsibility in this worship service today is to come in corporately, collectively, worship God together and exalt the glory of our great God. I love Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It goes on to say, my soul will make its boast in the Lord and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. The idea is that I'm going to bless the Lord. Collectively, the idea is we come together not as spectators, but as participators, and we are collectively honoring the Lord and blessing the Lord with all our heart. David continued in Psalms 34, and he said, Oh, magnify the Lord with, with me. So he's calling everybody else. He starts out individually. Now he's collectively, corporately. Let's all magnify the Lord's name. Let's all, us, plural, exalt the name, his name together forever. So you see this call to worship. From the, the psalmist here says, not only will I bless the Lord, we need to all magnify the Lord, and we need to all be glorifying God and blessing his name forever and ever. In fact, I want to look a little closely at the, the concept of magnifying the Lord. What does that mean? You have a magnifying glass at home. These glasses I'm reading, they're really, they're magnifying glasses. They're not like corrective lenses that you might get, you know, for nearsighted and farsighted. These are magnifiers, all right? They're readers, we call them. And they, these are 1.75, which means that whatever's down here is 1.7 times bigger, 0.75 times bigger than what it really is when I put the glasses on, which makes it so much easier to read. All right. That's part of the beauty of getting older, by the way. The eyes go a little bit so that when you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror and say, oh, I don't look so bad. <laughs> Just don't get ready with your readers on. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Somebody said, but Brother Joe, you look really good. I reached in my pocket and handed him my readers. And I said, now, now tell me what you think. <laughs> get a real look. See what you think. 
The idea is we magnify the Lord. It makes things look bigger. You say, well, how can you make God any bigger than he already is? Uh, folks, we don't make him any bigger than he already is, but we magnify him so that people can see just how big he is. We come in this place today. Some of you come in carrying some heavy stuff. You've had heavy burdens. You've been through trials. You've been through crisis. And in reality, your problems, your situation looks massive. And God may seem about this big in all of it. You ever get those places in your life? It just seems like, you know, God, where, what Psalms 22, David says, Oh, Lord, why are you standing so far away? Why are you so far off? No, God wasn't far off. He just looked small. God was right there the whole time. But what happens when we magnify our problems, then it seems to decrease our perceptibility, our, our consciousness, our awareness of just how big God is because we've made everything else bigger than God. But let me give you some good news today. They're not bigger than God. Nothing's bigger than God. So we need to join in with David and say, let us magnify the Lord together and let him appear as big as he really is because he's bigger than all these other things that somehow we have made bigger than what they really are. Ever said that point like David said in Psalms 22, Oh Lord, why aren't you coming to my aid? Why aren't you assisting? Why aren't you helping? And all the time we've missed it because he's really there. I, I'll refer to a little bit verse later in, in, in Psalm 73 where he says, you know, I, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I saw how this, the wicked got away with everything. There was no judgment. There's, you know, they just live in ungodliness and there's no punishment for their sins. And he says, until I came into the sanctuary of the Lord. When I got in the presence of God, I started seeing God on the scene. Then I began to realize. So what are we doing? We worship God together. We're magnifying the Lord and exalting Him. But also, you know, there's, there is a collective power in our praise together. You know, there's people who say, well, you know, I, I really don't need to go to church. You know, I can worship wherever I want. But the Bible tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. One guy told me, well, you know, Brother Joe, I can worship on the golf course. I said, but you don't. Yeah, come on. You play golf. You know what I think about when I'm on the golf course? How lousy my golf game is. Yeah. What do I think about when I go fishing? Usually fishing. Why aren't they biting? What kind of bait? What can I change? Maybe I'm in the wrong spot. All these things, you're fishing. That's why it's important that we learn that there is this thing that God has called us to as the assembly of God, the people of God, to come together and to worship God and to exalt the Lord God together. There's this thing that if we miss out on, it's going to be a great blessing in our life. When we come together, there's this great power, this great grace that God gives us. He calls us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We ought to come together and worship God together. Why? Because there's a whole lot of good things that happen when we worship God together. Hebrews 10, 25 is the verse there. It says, you know, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people, you know, do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is nearing. He said, in fact, the closer he gets, the more you ought to make sure you meet together with the other saints. You ought to be in church. It's not something that you do occasionally. It's something we come together and we are strengthened, we're encouraged by. In fact, if you went to Hebrews 10, there's a couple of verses, 23 and 24, right there with it. It says there's two good reasons we don't neglect coming together. One is, he said, let's hold our confession, hold fast our confession uh, without wavering. What happens when we worship together? It helps me with other people who are holding fast their confession. I'm encouraged by their confession. They're encouraged by my confession. We're all standing for the same thing. We're all choosing to live the same kind of life. We're all battling the same enemy. We need to hold fast our confession together. That's why we don't neglect the assembly. We're encouraged by one another. But he also said, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good works. The King James Version says it like this. Let us consider how to provoke one another. First time I read this, I asked some folks I'm ready to provoke. <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm pretty good at provoking. But the idea, it's not a negative here. It's a good thing. We provoke one another to love. We provoke one another. We encourage one another. That's why it's important we have corporate worship and corporate praise because it affects our life. God is doing something in us when we choose to, to magnify Him. There is a power that God lets loose in our hearts and in our lives that works within the context of the body of Christ. So when we come together and we speak together, we love together, we, we hold to the same truths and the same things, God is glorified. Our lives are literally changed. 
Uh, this morning, if I were to take off this microphone, you know, you'd just hear my ordinary voice. I could probably carry this room, but for the sake of the CDs and the DVDs and all the other things that we are producing and putting on the Internet and sending out to, to different people and pastors and countries, we put it on a, rec- on a microphone. But the microphone does something else as well. It also magnifies the voice, all right? What happens when we collectively come together? It magnifies it even more so. He is exalted on even a greater level. So we worship God together, and as we worship God together, we're experiencing His power together. But we're also showing God off. Psalms 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. What does that mean? Remember we talked about celebrating. Well, obviously, if you celebrate, there's a celebrity. And the celebrity is the Lord. And there's no one none other than God that is more deserving of glory and praise than God himself. So we glorify the Lord. It literally means that I'm going to show him off. I'm going to ascribe him glory. I'm going to let people around me hear how good God is. I'm going to let people around me see how good God is. So we're going to celebrate him. In fact, when you go back to Ephesians, there's that passage in chapter 1. I think there's like 12 verses where Paul is praying. We'll look at a little bit a little later on. He said, well, I pray for you. And he goes into this long, probably the longest sentence in the New Testament. Or in fact, the whole Bible, I think. It just goes on and on. 12 verses without a period. All right? In other words, when you get your praise on, you forget about your grammar. <laughs> when you get to glorifying God, you don't worry about the long sentence structure. you got a lot to say. you got a lot to glorify God on. And we ought to be doing this because God is honored in this way as we begin to ascribe Him glory. I think one of the reasons we don't see a lot of God's glory in church many times is because people are just kind of there and they're attending. And they might sing along a little bit, but they're not really about praise They're not really about worship. They're not really about giving God glory and honoring His holy name, that we lift Him up. Psalms 22, 3. Psalms 22, David starts out, Where are you, God? By the time he gets to verse 3, he says, You are holy and you are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. There's another passage. God inhabits the praises of Israel. What happens? I believe as we praise God that He's enthroned amongst those praises. We know He's enthroned amongst the praises of the angels. They're around the throne singing, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with His glory. We ought to be joining that chorus. We ought to be singing those songs. And again, not just individually. We sing those songs corporately. That the, we sing that the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. Isaiah got a little glimpse into that worship service in Isaiah chapter 6 when he said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. They're worshiping God. My lips aren't worshiping God. I'm not praising the Lord. And somehow when we really get a glimpse into what's going on in heaven, I think most of us would come back and say, oh man, my mouth is dirty too. I need to get what's coming out of my mouth and that which honors and glorifies His name because His name is due all the glory. And we've been given as the church this collective responsibility, but greater than that, this collective privilege to join in to that worship and the adoration of holy God. And we ought to take it as serious as we can. We ought to learn to worship God with all our hearts. So we ascribe Him glory, which literally means show Him off, put Him on display so we can see and others can see around us just how glorious He is. You are holy, you are enthroned among the praises of Israel. You inhabit the praises of your people. You're enthroned amidst all those glorious things. Worship God. What else does worship do? Not only does it lift us up to to, to the Lord, it, it lifts the Lord up, it lifts us up to a higher place. And that's important that we come together, that we lift up the Lord. And as we lift up the Lord, guess what? He is lifting us up. He lifts us up. Remember my sermon one for those who are part of the series. We talked about the spiritual realm and we talked about the physical realm. And we talked about how this physical realm is really affected by the spiritual realm. That if you want to see things happen in a physical realm around you, then you need to get to where the spiritual things are going on. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Angels, and obviously... The negative side of that is demons, Satan, his cohorts who are trying to affect things in a negative manner. But we can have a positive impact when we begin to realize that we are part of the spiritual family of God and that our prayers, our lives, our choices, our decisions, our holy life, all those make an impact and a difference. Sometimes we're in there trying to wrestle it out, flesh and blood, change things, change people. Listen, nobody can change things or change people but God. 
And so we want to realize how important it is I get with God and I walk with God and I be where God is and I be remembering to, to, to walk in a holy life in holy places with my holy God. Now in Ephesians, when Paul's praying that prayer in verse 1, he says, Blessed be the God. Remember we said that's the main foundation for praise, just to honor God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he done? He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, I love it because what he's saying is, I lift him up and bless him. What's he doing to me? He's lifting me up to heavenly places and blessing me. Ain't that good? As I lift him up and bless him, he's lifting me up and blessing me. That's just glorious to think that God loves me so much and loves us as a family, as a church, that he would lift us up to heavenly places. So we can participate in what he's doing, and then our lives can begin to affect the thing. I mean, if you really want to fix something wrong in the earthly places, then you start moving towards the heavenly places and see what God does. We want to reach into those heavenly places and bless the Lord in those heavenly places because that's where God moves, and that's where God inhabits, and that's where God rules. So I need to live my life from that place. The Bible says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I want to live my life from that position, not from one of defeat, not from one of doom, not one from despair. I want to live a life of blessing God, honoring God, that moves myself to get the right perspective of life and then see what God does as I exalt Him, see what He does in me. As I humble myself, the Bible says He exalts me. So if you want to see something that's wrong, if you see something that's wrong in the physical realm, uh, be affected by the spiritual realm, you've got to go to the spiritual realm. How do we enter in? With thanksgiving, with praise, with adoration, with worship. You want to get God's presence? Then you verbally, visually, vocally, I mean, move into that place of giving everything in your heart over to the Lord. But too often we miss that. We just miss it completely because we're not living our life from that perspective. Here's what Dr. Tony Evans says, great quote. He said, this is why God's people ought to come to church, to encounter Him in authentic worship, not to watch what's happening or just gather more information about God. There's a world of difference between coming to church to meet your friends or hear a sermon and coming to church to meet God. Great quote, isn't it? Because this is where the, the, the culture is, the Christian culture today. They come to church. When they do come to church, they come to church to hear a sermon, or maybe sing some songs, hear the music. Let the professionals do it, you know. That's what they're paid, trained, and, and prepared to do. They got the sermon together. Let them do all that. But it's a spectator thing. It's not a participating thing because they don't understand the heartbeat of what God has called the church to be and the church to do. There's a world of difference between coming to church to meet your friends, hear a sermon, and coming to church to meet God. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at my wife on Saturday night and said, tomorrow's Sunday. We get to go to the greatest day of the week, that day we set aside to glorify God and be with God's people, sing praise together, and I get to preach. <laughs> I get to talk about God. My favorite day of the week. Not because I get to preach, because we are here and we are together and we are exalt we're exalting our Lord together and we're honoring God together. That's a glorious privilege and a glorious blessing. You know, don't get caught up in the, in the, in the world where you got, well, it's Sunday morning, I get up, where's my shoes and my tie, honey, where's my coat, you know, and get all this stuff, and then everybody's fighting and going through all the mess, you know, and, you know, and everybody's arguing away church and griping about stuff, and you get to church, of course you're holy then. Step on holy ground. Hey, bless God, brother. Good to see you. How you doing, sister? Hallelujah. You got good today. You know, you just wanted to rip your son's eyeballs out of his head a while ago, but now everything's spiritual. Listen, we need to come. Before we get in these doors, we need to say, I'm entering those doors with thanksgiving and praise. My heart's going to get right, and I'm going to go with God. And I'm going to walk in the Spirit today from the moment I get up there, before I get out of bed, I'm going to put on my hallelujah shoes and my hallelujah clothes in it because it, praise looks good on me, so I'm going to wear it today, and I'm going to honor the Lord today. And let's exalt the Lord. And we begin to exalt Him. This is where it comes to that point where we say, I'm going to move everything out of the way, and I'm going to seek God's face, and I'm going to walk with God today. Simple question, let me ask you today. <clears throat> Anybody ever been on a blind date? I went on one. Wished I was blind. <laughs> Warning side for you single guys when your buddies try to set you up and they say something like this she's got a wonderful personality <laughs> if that's the first word she may have a wonderful personality but if that's the first word you may be in for a surprise anyway you go on a blind date but you know you're not so trusting after that it was all over me no more blind dates you know, you're gonna, just, that ain't going to happen I want to see this person I want to meet this person you know before I ever you know, step out the door with anybody. 
Now, here's the good thing about with Jesus. There's, there's no blind date with him. We can, we can, we can have a, a, a revelation. Oh, now we know we're not going to see God physically, you know, and that day's coming when, we, when we're glorified and we're able to handle it. If we saw him now, he'd just blow our brains out and kill us, you know. wouldn't be able to handle it. God's so glorious. But we'll have this incorruptible and this glorified body, so it'll be different then. But now we can, let me say it this way, we can perceive God, you know. The Bible talks about blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the pure in heart, they still see God. I, I believe there's a way we can perceive God even now that we can, we can know in God's presence. You know what it's like to come into this place on a day when people are really worshiping. And there seems to be this collective attitude of holiness and, and unction and hunger to worship God together. And, and, and you walked out of this church when that's happening. You said, man, the Lord was, you, you got a little glimpse of glory, you know. You just got a little, little taste of what God was doing. That's what happens, I really believe, when we get serious about walking with God and entering into this place and saying, hey, you know, I really want to walk with you today. Remember Job when he had all the conflicts as you read the story and man, his world's falling apart. Everything's terrible. It's, it's, I mean, death and despair, it's bad. And all his friends came along to help out and they all gave him, you know, well, if you didn't have all that sin in your heart, if you just believed God and all, you know, how friends can be. And God just got him off all by himself. And then Job kind of got in his own defense and said, well, you know, I've done this and the people know me in the gates and I've honored you here. And, I, you know, and God said, <clears throat> where were you when I created the the foundations upon which the earth stands. And where were you when I slung the stars in the space? And God goes to this little treatise, you know, which basically says, and who are you? <laughs> who are you? And Job got broken. I mean, he gets humbled at this point. Because where, where do we really get to see God? It's when we humble ourselves. And, and there's a lot of people who, you know, they won't praise God because they're not humble. Well, you know, I just, you know, I just want to stand here and do my thing. I don't, you know, all what, what people might think about, might say, if I get excited, if I close my eyes, worship, or I raise my hands, or I didn't raise my hands. It's just so worried about it. everybody else. Quit worried about it, people. Amen. Just come in and bless the Lord and exalt the Lord and collectively join your voice with the people of God, and let's just worship Him together. Job, when he gets to the end of all this, after he gets humble, he says, I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. What is he saying? Remember, what Job chapter 1 opens up, this is the most godly man on the earth. And he's saying, you know, I didn't really know you. It all been in my head and my ears, but now I, I, I got a glimpse. When it came to that place of humility before God, when it came to that place of surrender before God, and so many times, you know, we, we, we just fail to get to the place of humility. We, we, we may get troubled and we may get hurt. And we, may, we may go through crisis in our life, but how many times do we ever get humble before God? You know, the Bible says, you know, uh, it talks about a broken and contrite heart, you know. The, but it also says, a wounded spirit who can bear. There's a lot of people who have a wounded spirit. They're hurt, all right? But they hadn't gone from hurt to brokenness. And then you say, where's the difference? One focuses on you, your crisis, your failure, your problem, your enemy. Whatever. The other one focuses on God. So move out of hurt Move out of woundedness. I mean, to be bruised and wounded, that's a hard place to live. You have to move past that, though. So we say, now I'm going to move into the presence of God. And that's, remember, we talked about David when he said that in Psalms. When I got into the presence of God, then, then I began to perceive. So we have to come to this place where worship literally becomes a priority in our life. I want to know God. I want to experience Him in my worship. I need to see Him face to face and perceive Him in my life and whatever He's saying. And that's what Jesus speaks about in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Tim's been doing this aerial overview on Wednesday nights, Pastor Strickland has. But in the first of that, remember how Jesus is moving among the lampstands of the seven churches and He's speaking a word to the angels or the messengers or the pastors, however you interpret that part. Anyway, He's speaking a word to them. And most of them aren't listening at this point. And I think that's what happens. People come to the church today and the Lord's moving amongst the lampstands. God's moving amongst the church and He's wanting to reveal Himself and He's wanting to speak to us, but we don't hear Him because our focus is on things below and not on things above. And the Lord says, hey, if you have ears to hear, listen. Listen. But you can't listen to Him if all you're listening to is your thoughts and your subconscious and your accusations and your condemnations and faith, all that. you got to get to where you come to the cross say, Lord, everything's on the altar today. I want to exalt you. It's not about me. But you know, the church today is so perverted and the message is so perverted. We've got preachers that get up every Sunday after Sunday and tell us how to be more blessed, how to be more successful, and how to be more prosperous. It's called the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of the life. That's what they're preaching today. Amen? That's what's being preached today. What do we preach? We, we preach Christ Jesus, as we said the week before. 
and Him crucified. We exalt Christ because in Christ we find our life. In Christ we find our healing. In Christ we find forgiveness. In Christ we find our peace. We find our victory. It's all in Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen because He is the answer. That's why we exalt Him. And that's why we come collectively to praise His name. Worship has to be a priority. It's not something we've tacked onto the service until everybody gets here. So that the crowd will be here when it's time to preach. No, man, if you're dragging your feet for worship, you're missing, you're missing God. And I bet you if you drag your feet for worship and you don't participate in worship, the message is not as deep as it could be in the way God really wants it to be. We have to come in hungry. In fact, the, the degree of our hunger determines the degree of my satisfaction. The hungrier I am, the more satisfied I am. You know? People say, well, I just didn't get anything out of that. Maybe you didn't come hungry. Yeah. That's why a lot of people they go to church, they never go to church hungry. That's why the preacher can take a sucker, a little old sugar stick, and stick it in their mouth, and they're happy to go home with that. You know, like a baby crying, you know, you can't get out the food, and you can't get out the bottles, and you stick a pacifier in their mouth. Suck on this. And the baby's happy for a little bit. Because there's nothing coming out of it. There's no nutrition. There's nothing that's filling. There's nothing that's coming. And so the baby spits the pacifier out and begins to cry. Why? The baby's hungry. But so many Christians are satisfied with little spiritual pacifiers and preachers who stick the little pacifiers in their mouth. And they're starving for spiritual nutrition. How do we get that? I think we get it supremely by, first of all, supremely worshiping the Lord. The psalmist who wrote that, Psalm 73, when he said, everything is, looks bad, it's all despair, the wicked are prospering, they get away with their sin. I, he said, in fact, when I saw this, he said, he said I was ready to backslide. That, that's the Jorm's translation. Said, I put it in the King James. My feet had well nigh slipped. He says, I bet stumble. The next verse, until I came into the sanctuary, your sanctuary, O God, and then I understood. They're not getting away with anything. And he goes on, read this psalm today. Go home and read it. It's just a, it's a great psalm. It, it, it just talks about, when I got in your presence, I understood you're with me. They're, they're going to face terrible judgment, and I'm not. You're going to lift me up to heaven. I'm going to be with you eternally. I'm going to experience your grace and blessings. And I already have you right now. You hold my hand and you walk with me. I just hadn't seen it. What well, gives us the capacity to see that? When worship becomes a priority in our life and worship becomes the priority that it ought to be in the church, it connects us with the power of God. Later on in Ephesians, when Paul's writing to the church, he says, I bow my knees, therefore, to the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that you... So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, why, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what's the breadth, what's the length, what's the height, what's the depth, to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Here's this prayer that Paul is praying. I am praying for you. And we've used that, maybe you've used that for other people, you prayed for people. But understand, Paul is not praying for individuals here, he's praying for the church. This is the prayer we pray for our church, that we as a people, we as a collective group of people, no one is an island here. We're all interrelated, interconnected. We've all been made part of the same family. We have the same Father. We have the same Holy Spirit indwelling us, all right? We may be different as day and night in the exterior, but in the interior, we're all alike in Christ Jesus. And he says, I just want you to know what God's done for you, that you can see the depth, height, the breadth of all this, that God give you the wisdom that you need to see that who you are in Christ and what God's done for you. And he goes in this glorious prayer about how God is, wants to do something to the church and for the church. Remember, this is not written in, in the singular. When he says praying for you, the word in the Greek language is not a singular you, like one person. In the English language, you is a singular or it's a plural, but not in the Greek. There was a, there was a you that's you individually, and there was a you that was you as the group. And so he said, this is a group prayer. This is written to the church, that when you come together to worship, that you'll see what God is up to. You'll see him in every way, and you will experience the power of God together. That's what he desires. Verse 21 goes on down like this. He says, now, after this prayer, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to, here's, he gets his praise going, all right? To him be glory. What's the next three words? In the church. What's the next three words? In Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. 
How many times have you told a Christian brother or sister and seeking to encourage them, hey, God can do far more abundantly above all you think or ask? That's true, and he can. But he says the way he wants to do it is in the church, through us, through us. You know, but we've lost that connection and we've lost that concept in the church today. You know, it's because people have become selfish and individualistic and that mind, that's the culture we live in. That cultural mindset has filtered into the minds of a lot of Christians. They, they don't realize that they're part of a greater part, all right? They're part of a body that, they're, they're, they, that needs them to function properly and they need the body so that they can function properly. Put it this way. This is another quote from Dr. Evans. He said, God doesn't pour out his choice blessings on selfish children who refuse to become an active part of his body. Now, I know, folks, there's probably some of you here today, you're not an active part of church. You just kind of come when you come. All right, and I love you, and I'm your pastor, and I will continue to love your pastor. But if I'm going to be the man of God that God's called me to be for you, to help you, to shepherd you, then I need to tell you, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is but especially because we're closer than we've ever been to the coming of Christ Jesus, that verse goes on to say, we need to be faithful to the body, to other believers, to the Lord, and to be what God's called us to be in regard to each other. Not to be these little islands that are sitting out here, some kind of spiritual lone ranger. God never called us that. He wants to bless us in spiritual places, but when you read it in the context, and you know how I'm about context, 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 these blessings that he's talking about in Ephesians are poured out on the body as a whole, the people of God, as he speaks to them so that they can experience the blessings of God together. You know, there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign from his throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years, called the millennial reign of Christ. And there's a passage where Zechariah is prophesying about this, and he says, It will be that whoever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, then the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Now, isn't it amazing? Here he is, Jesus is on the throne in Jerusalem, perfect world, millennial reign of Christ. Lion, you know, the lion, the lamb, the whole thing, swords beating the plowshares, no war, none of those things. It's just going to be a perfect world as far as the world can be. And Jesus is on the throne, and still going to be people who don't receive him, don't believe him. And the families, the Bible tells us prophetically that the kings of the earth and the presidents and the prime ministers, and they're all going to go up to Jerusalem and honor the king. And the families of the earth will go up to Jerusalem and honor the king. And God says, you know, if you don't come and do honor and bless the Lord, he said, there'd be no rain. Now, that's all millennial, but I believe there's a, a particular principle in this for our lives. Rain always symbolizes the blessings of God. And I think that's what he's saying, that the people who don't have time to worship God will not are going to experience the blessings of God. How often does the New Testament make a reference to us collectively worshiping God and collectively experiencing the blessings of God? God wants to bless our church. God wants to bless you in the midst of this church. But if we want to open that door and kick down that wall that would hinder it, then we have to enter into praise together and worship together and recognizing God is big God, and he's a great God, and he deserves our honor and our praise. He, uh, he deserves us to exalt him and magnify him and glorify him. And if we don't do that, then too often we will miss the glory of God and the blessings of God. Collective worship, it's a powerful thing. On the stage up here, we have uh, what some electricians don't like a lot, which is sometimes why the lights go out occasionally. We have power strips. You know what power strips are? You'll get them out for Christmas, I'm sure, with all the lights and stuff. Power strips, anywhere from four to six, eight plugs in some of them, you know, that you can plug a bunch of stuff into and just plug it into one outlet. You know, you're limited by just the little one outlet on the wall, the one little two, two receptacles in it, so you, you get you a power strip, you know, and you plug it in. Why? So that more things can have access to the power. Well, this church is our power strip, folks. <laughs> This is where we come collectively. We all plug in, and we don't have to worry about blowing a breaker. Amen? Because there's no breaker blowing with God. He just blows our minds. Amen? Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above, that means mind-blowing. That's the Joram's translation. Exceedingly abundantly above, more than we can think or ask, through the church. This is our power strip. We collectively come in and experience the grace and the presence and the power of God together. Now, if you just come in, you can't wait to get to lunch, or you just kind of come in to see your friends, you come in because your mama made you come, or your wife made you, or your husband, you know, made you put down the foot in there, we're going to go to church today. No matter, if you just come in, you're missing it. But if you come in with an attitude, man, I'm going I'm to plug into God today and God's people and God's 
presence. And I'm going to enjoy the Lord today. It's amazing what God will do with your life. Change your mindset about worship. Change your mindset about church because it will change your very life. Because remember, it's the spiritual that affects the physical. And we get to change in our hearts and minds about God's will and God's way and God's word and God's worth. Guess what happens? He changes our hearts. He changed our, in fact, you know what the word in the English translation out of the Bible for change your mind is? Repent. We just repent. Get proper thinking about God and his will and his word and his worth. It'll change our lives. Every one of you this week, you'd be honest, you've been in a battle of sorts. Some of you have been strong battles, some of you have been small battles, some of you have been some massive battles this week. You come into church with the people of God and we gather together around the Word of God and we gather in praise and worship to recognize our Heavenly Father. It is amazing what you can leave this place with a sense of renewal and a sense of revival that the world can't get down at the, their little rotary meetings or knitting clubs. All right? What God offers us and us collectively as a family is something very special and something very unique and something very beautiful. That you can come into this place you know, away from the noise, away from the war, away from the junk, and hear from the Lord, and hear from the people who love you, and encourage one another, and provoke one another to love and to good works, and to set your heart and mind on God. You leave here refreshed. You leave here saying, thank you, Jesus. That was a spiritual vitality that I needed. You're not going to get that in the world. Why? That's enemy territory for the most part. The devil's doing his thing. He's the God, little g, of this world. But when we come here... What's well, kind of like, well, you know when a football team's out doing their thing today? You know what you want in the football team? You want home field advantage. Why? Because your love there, they can make the noise there, they can help you out there, your actions are encouraged continually. Home court advantage. You know what we got on every Sunday? We got home field advantage right here. And we ought to be taking advantage of that. You come in. And I don't care, I, listen, you may have blown it big time, but here we understand we've all blown it big time. <laughs> all right? We've all experienced the grace of God. And, and sometimes we walk around, well, what if somebody, <laughs> and if they knew, they'd probably say, is that all? <laughs> you, know where I, you know what God took me out of? You know what God walked me through? You know what God delivered me from? You, know, you want to know my failures? You, you really want to see my failures? God's God to fix that. God's God who heals that. That's, that's, the, that's the sanctifying power of the grace of God to change our lives. Come on in and get some. Come on in and experience that life that comes only through the gracious presence of God's pe pr His presence among His people. It's a powerful thing. Get your praise on. Amen. Get your hallelujahs going. Get your love for Jesus going. And confess before the Lord a good confession when you come here. And encourage one another. But it starts with our attitude towards praise and towards him in worship. Would you stand with your heads bowed?